talking about the way Jesus walked, trying to uh, learn how we should imitate him and trying to make them all start with M's. So I'm needing to spend quite a bit of time every, day, every uh, week in the dictionary and the thesaurus trying to find M words for what I want to, uh, to talk about. And this is melioration. Jesus walked in melioration. Meliorate comes from a Latin word, which means making better, causing improvement, developing strength. The English holds with it the idea of to make or to become better, to make it more bearable, more satisfactory, or to improve. Jesus walked in a sense of making things better. How? Did Jesus make things better? See, here's how I make it work. He made things better by the practice of demonstrating forgiveness. Jesus, as mediator, was the prime forgiver. Not only during his life did he practice forgiveness, his whole purpose in being was to establish forgiveness, to make things better, to improve, to develop strength, by the process of forgiveness. Modern jaywalkers then are going to commit themselves to do what Jesus did. And WWJD, what did Jesus do? Jesus walked in this spirit of forgiveness. And John says whoever claims, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And so that's what our theme is all about, walking as Jesus walked. By the way, this I found this, uh, this new poster. Instead of uh, WWJD, it's H-D-Y-K-Y-J-Y-D-I-Y-D-K-W-J-D. Much easier to remember. But it stands for, how do you know what Jesus would do if you don't know what Jesus did? And so that really is the essence of why we're studying the walk of Jesus. How would we know what Jesus would do if we don't know what Jesus did? So today we're going to talk about Jesus as the forgiver. You know, if, uh, if our greatest need had been information, then God would have sent an educator. And Jesus would have had more initials behind his name than any human has ever had. And he would have come with a greater ability to present information than anyone who's ever walked the face of the earth. If our greatest need had been technology, then God would have sent a scientist, and he would have been a mastermind. He would have had all the solutions in the realm of technology and science. If our greatest need had been financial, Jesus would have come as the world's greatest economist. If our need had been pleasure, Jesus would have been the greatest entertainer that has ever lived. But our greatest need our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent a forgiver. Jesus walked as a forgiver. He lived as a forgiver. He died as a forgiver. He lives today as a forgiver because that's our greatest need. That's what we need the most. Colossians puts it this way, since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Make allowances for each other's faults and give anyone who offends, forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Jesus is the great forgiver. When it comes to motivating my forgiveness, there is one that I hold forth as an example. And it's not another human being. It's the Son of God. As He forgave, as the Lord has forgiven so I am able to seek to imitate his forgiveness. Well, how did Jesus forgive? How did he do that? I want to suggest, first of all, that Jesus forgave people who came at the point of repentance. And again, a beautiful example found here in Luke chapter 7, the lady who comes with the expensive ointment and breaks that ointment and puts it on Jesus' feet. She's identified as a sinner, not in the sense that we all sin, but she is one who has, been, has missed the mark of society. She is a lost person and she comes to Jesus and anoints his feet and kisses his feet and, and dries his feet with her hair and Jesus recognizes her. He grants her forgiveness. Why? Because he's the great forgiver and he recognizes 
that when one repents, there is a need for forgiveness, and he passes that on to this lady. However, Jesus also forgave those who were experiencing no sorrow for their misbehavior. As a matter of fact, Jesus forgave people who were still engaged in the process of hurting and persecuting him. And we read uh, just a few moments ago, as Caleb did, in Luke chapter 23, that while hanging upon the cross, Jesus looked out, and what did he pray? Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. Jesus forgave people who didn't ask for forgiveness, who had no intention of repenting. Jesus still offered them forgiveness. Now, there's two gigantic differences in those types of forgiveness. The first type of forgiveness is granted to those who repent so that there can be a restoration of relationship. So Jesus forgave people so that he could enjoy relationship. The woman who anointed his feet with oil did so because she desired a longing relationship with Jesus. He forgave so that that, re that relationship could be there. But Jesus also forgave for his own peace, his own calm. And so as he's enduring the turmoil of the cross, looking at the people who are spitting in his face, who are mocking him, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is not meaning there, I have relationship with them. Jesus is saying, I'm going to forgive even those who are doing me harm because that's what I need to do. It brings about my peace, my strength. So we're to forgive like Jesus forgave. How did Jesus forgive? He forgave people that were penit penitent. He forgave people that weren't. That, in a nutshell, is the forgiving process of Jesus. Jesus walked in this sense of forgiveness. He made things better and sought improvement in relationship when uh, uh, there was repentance. But Jesus also knew that there was a way of making things more bearable, more satisfactory, again, more strength, personal strength in granting forgiveness even when the offense offenders were continuing in the action. So that's how Jesus forgave. I want us to uh, study a text, and we're going to begin today, continue next week. We're going to study a text in which Jesus outlines three different things. He's going to talk about, first of all, the process of forgiveness. Secondly, he's going to describe the practice of forgiveness, and then lastly, the power of forgiveness. Today we cover merely the first one, the process of being a forgiver like Jesus forgave. What do I need to do to engage in the process of forgiveness? Our text is going to be Luke chapter 17. We begin today to look at verses 3 and 4. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. I'm going to look at, uh, I want to suggest three different ways that Jesus shows in this text the process of forgiveness. And here's where he begins. He begins saying that if we're going to be people who practice forgiveness, it's going to take a personal accountability. A personal accountability. Now, Verse 3, in various translations, renders it this way. New American Standard says, be on your guard. The NIV and the New Living say, so watch yourself. The King James says, take heed to yourself. The English Standard says, pay attention to yourselves. Do you get the point of what Jesus is saying? When it comes to this whole subject of forgiveness, where does it all start? It starts right here. Pay attention to yourself. Interesting and fascinating word in the Greek language, compounded, made up of the preposition pros, which means uh, it's the direction preposition, meaning uh, toward or near, and the word echo, which means to hold. Pros echomai. Jesus is saying, I want you to hold close to yourself when it comes to the subject of forgiveness. When you and I tend to think about forgiveness, it's about somebody else. Jesus says the process begins by holding ourselves close. The idea is that we hold ourselves so close, so near, that we're able to fully see who we are and what's going on in us. Do you remember uh, 
the first time probably back in high school biology class that you tried to look through a, a microscope and you put something on a slide and you examined it and you zoomed in on it and you saw for the first time the microscopic world. That's what Jesus is saying we do when it comes to the subject of forgiveness. It begins with a microscopic examination of me. Not the other person, but me. Now, interesting that this word appears in so many other places and it gives us, again, the same concept of what happens when something is close. For example, in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, it's used of the leaven of the Pharisees. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What is the meaning? You take that little bit and you hold it close and what happens? It grows and it spreads and it makes things bigger. It's also used in Luke chapter 21 when Jesus describes there the heart that is weighed down with the worries of life. Jesus says, if you take the worries of life and you hold them close, what does it do to your heart? It weighs it down. You bring that in tightly and what happens? It produces concerns that need not be there. It's also used in Acts chapter 16. Remember Lydia as she is converted by, by Paul, Saul at, uh, Paul at, the, uh, at the riverside. And it says she opened her heart to Paul's teaching. She took what Paul was saying and she brought it in tightly into her heart. And she believed it and she acted upon it. So the whole concept of looking, watching out for ourselves is the idea of bringing it in tightly to ourselves. What Jesus is doing here is showing that the discipline of forgiveness is filled with the possibilities of dangerous deceptions and distortions. And the best way to avoid that is to bring it close. To bring it in so I can examine myself. So I can carefully look at me. He is teaching that the heart of everyone called upon to forgive must be held close for examination, alteration, and purification. The process a forgiveness never begins with the offender. It always begins with personal culpability. I need to look at me. That's where Jesus starts. Watch out. Be on guard for yourself. If your brother sins, all starts here. Okay, so the first part of the approach, uh, of the process of forgiveness is that we make ourselves fully accountable. The second part is that we have a readiness to approach to approach the offender, a readiness to approach the offender. Again, our text says, be on your guard if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Rebuke him. If your brother sins, rebuke him. You know, sometimes we read that and we think, boy, I'd like to fulfill that command. Because our concept of rebuke in English is so totally different than the original language in which the New Testament is written. Let me give you some explanation. Jesus says, if someone has sinned against you, approach them about it. Rebuke is a compound word made up from epe, meaning upon or over, and timo, which means to prize, to value, to revere, or honor. Put those two concepts together. Biblical concept of rebuke is Go over, go upon someone. Why? Because I honor them. Because I see them as a prize. Because they are valued by me. Because I revere them. Now, folks, that's nothing like our English word rebuke. Our English word. We, can, they, we get the connotation of being able to scream and shout and say all kinds of things and and call people to account and make them mind and do all and we say that's rebuke no that's not biblical rebuke biblical rebuke is i esteem you so highly i honor you i value you so much that i'm going to come over i'm going to come upon the rebuke jesus taught and practiced was not a telling off but an occasion of teaching it is the way one uses the actions of another as a foundation for learning. A Jesus rebuke is honoring another person by a willingness to accurately use painful actions to create an atmosphere for their growth. 
In other words, I honor you so much. If a brother sins, I honor you so much that I desire your personal growth from this incident so strongly that I'm willing to approach. I, I, I am willing to put myself out there. Now, this is going to give you the sense of a proverb that you may have been puzzled by for a long time. Do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Okay, it doesn't say he will like you. It doesn't say he will, he will cherish you. It says he will love you. Now, in our English terminology, the way we use rebuke, I don't care how wise somebody is, you come down on them with a strong rebuke, it's probably not going to be love that is generated. Now, they might appreciate the criticism. And, you know, we talk about profiting from, from criticism. But what the text says is if you rebuke a wise man, he's going to do what? He's going to love you for that. Folks, this rebuke is the same rebuke that Jesus was talking about in the New Testament. This is coming over, coming upon for the purpose of honoring. You do that to a wise man, what's he going to do? <laughs> He's going to love you for it. You do that to a fool, someone who doesn't care, what's going to happen? It's mockery. They don't care. Instruct a wise man and he will be still, wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. So, Jesus says, I want you to rebuke. And there's this little word and in here. And if he repents, it's a primary participle in Greek. It has to do with connecting. And sometimes it carries a cumulative force. In other words, adding to what has already been said. It's most often translated and, but it could also be understood to mean something like also, or even, or so then, or to. Here Jesus is showing a connection between a rebuke and repentance. And the one who is doing the rebuking has already linked in their attitudes and in their words the objective of repentance. In other words, again, the rebuke is not a telling off. The rebuke is, I long, I long for repentance. That's where my words are coming from, to honor and to cherish. And so I, I come for that purpose. Uh, if we could, we could restructure that sentence, perhaps to make greater sense by something like this. Rebuke him so that... If he repents, you've prepared yourself to forgive him. Rebuke him so that to forgive him. By the way, simple logic also helps us reach that conclusion because if we don't reach that conclusion, then what we have Jesus teaching is the only time I have to forgive someone is what? If they repent. And obviously, Jesus didn't live that, and he didn't teach that. We are responsible to forgive even if others do not repent. So the only, the only other alternative is we read Luke, and we have Jesus saying, only when a brother repents do you need to forgive. Okay, so we've got accountability to self. We have approach to the offender as being part of the forgiveness process. And then lastly... We need to understand that, that, that forgiveness is, a, is an action word. It is an action activity. It is not an emotional one. Now, this is a really important point for us to get. Because in our day of touchy-feely and the, uh, alter, the, the, strain, the large focus on, on human feelings, we can quickly begin to believe that if we don't feel like doing something, it's hypocritical for us to do it. But again, that's not what Scripture teaches. Forgiveness is an action, not a feeling. Be on guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Our society's obsession with this, the, the feeling has created havoc in how we interpret the heavenly instruction that's given us here about forgiveness. Some Christians ha have become so socially manipulated that they believe, if I don't feel like this, I shouldn't do it because it would be hypocritical. 
If I don't have the warm fuzzies of forgiveness, I should not forgive because that's not right. Well, I have one question, and it's rooted in our text, and here it is. How many of you believe that you would have the warm, fuzzy kind of forgiveness for the same person seven times in one day? Do you believe you would have the warm fuzzies seven times in a day? Now let's break that down, give you eight hours of sleep. That means you're forgiven the same person about every two and a half hours. You wake up eight o'clock, okay, I forgive you. 10.30 rolls around, got to forgive you again. Noon, sit down to enjoy my vittles, all of a sudden I got to forgive you again. How many of you think that you're going to be feeling like granting forgiveness at 10 o'clock that evening? Jesus is not talking about a feeling. He's talking about an action. And again, if it begins with accountability of me, then the action is going to be self-generated. It's not going to be emotional. Jesus is showing that jaywalkers treading his path of forgiveness are not seeking a journey of fuzzy feelings and emotional exaltation. Their purposeful walk recognizes that forgiveness is an action to be taken, not an emotion to be felt. Now again, did Jesus ever feel like forgiving people? Yeah. Is that the only time Jesus forgave? No. Why? Because feeling forgiveness is not a feeling, it's an action. And if you engage in the action of forgiveness and you get a feeling from that, then praise God. If you engage in the action of forgiveness and you don't get a feeling and a person keeps on, being an offender, you keep on forgiving. It's not tied to feeling. On one occasion, Jesus was giving instruction concerning uh, faith-filled prayers. And he described, he described in this text that if you have enough faith, you can pray to a mountain. And what will the mountain do? Thrown into the sea. And folks, that's an awful lot of faith. The point of Jesus' prayer is about faith. The instruction that Jesus is giving is that when we ask God, when we approach God, we had better be believing that we're going to receive. That's his point. That's the context. But look at what he continues into. Therefore, I tell you, whenever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against another, against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Jesus says, when you're standing... Offering this prayer, this prayer of faith that is so powerful that it will move mountains. When you're having that kind of commitment in God, when you're having that kind of trust in God to be able to do what you're asking Him to do, what are you supposed to ask to be able to do? Forgive. Why? Because it's a faith-empowered action, not a human emotion of feeling. When you pray to God, you ask Him to be able to forgive. Sounds a whole lot different than what sometimes the world propagates as what's needed for forgiveness. The impetus for forgiveness in this teaching is that when you stand praying, when you are connected with the Father of the universe, trusting in his power, you ask him to help you forgive. Why? Because <laughs> sometimes forgiveness seems as impossible as moving a mountain into the sea. So you ask God. You ask God for it. Because it's a faith-empowered action. Don't wait around for a feeling. No lingering until animosity is overpowered by adoration or changes in the offender. When you stand to offer faith-filled prayers, ask God to give you the strength to engage in the action of forgiveness. Why? Because forgiveness is an action empowered by submission to the Father and faith in his ability to make it reality. It's not waiting until caustic concepts are conquered by cordial ones. Okay. Forgiveness process. I have an accountability to myself first and foremost. When I'm looking at the process of forgiveness, 
It has more to do with me than anyone else. And therefore, I must hold all of this close. I must bring it in tightly. There must be a willingness to approach, to rebuke the sin. But the rebuke is one done with an understanding and a longing for repentance. It is already connected with that. And again, the rebuke is in honoring someone, not ridicule, not belittle, but honoring and valuing someone else. And then recognizing that the process of forgiveness is an action. It's not a feeling. And that God will enable me to forgive because I don't have to wait for the feeling. I just need to wait for the power of God to be at work in me. That's the process. Next week, we will look into the practice and the power of forgiveness taught in the same text. We'll just be continuing on down in Luke chapter.